what about all the people who need to hear your laughter, who need to hear your wildness, who need to hear your wackiness, who need to hear how loud you are? Welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I'm super happy you're here. On the show, I focus on creative thinking, problem solving, and living. Most often, I'll discuss how to ignite inspiration, meet challenges, and achieve goals through creative thinking. Sometimes, I'll have guests who give their perspective. Usually, it's people who are already living their best and most creative lives. Okay, let's get to it. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am thrilled that you are here. I am also thrilled to introduce you to today's guest. She's an actress, a model, a musician, a film producer, a painter, a poet, a philanthropist, and so much more. I am delighted to introduce you to Katie Chinakis. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Hello, humans. Yay. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. And it was it's really wonderful to hear you talk. Just a few minutes ago, we were just talking about your name. First of all, I know that you are from a Greek family and you are from Michigan. Yay, Michigan. We're both from Detroit Woo-hoo. in a way. Yeah. And I would love to talk to you about this idea that you have two first names. You have Katie and you have your uh, sort of original, your, your uh, baptized name, you said, mm-hmm. that is Kiriaki. I'd love yeah. to hear about what led to you having two first names and which one you go by now. Sure, sure. <laughs> so um, yes, I have uh, two first names, uh, Katie, and then um, my other first name is Kiriaki. So in the Greek tradition, we're named after saints and goddesses, and I'm named after the saint, Saint Kiriaki. She was a prominent saint. She was very rare, very intelligent. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a book on, you know, icons, there's books on saints, and I've read her story through and through. So to understand the deeper meaning, I think um, names are so important. And a lot of people like some people know what their names mean. And some people like do not know what their names mean. And it's like, yeah, in in the American culture, it's like a lot of times it's like, oh, my name's this or this, but they don't have any like context to it. And I think it's so important to know how and like where you stem from. So on my dad's side of the family, um, we're Greek. And uh, my dad's mom, In the Greek tradition, you're named um, after, you know, the mother, and then you're named after, you know, the the grandfather next. So um, I'm named after my yaya. So my yaya is my bestest friend in the whole entire world. So, well, actually my sister, Anna, Anna, she was named after my dad's grandmother. And then ironically, my mother's um, mom is... um, Anna as well. So, um, that, that worked out on, uh, for the first child. Cause both, both grandparents on each side were named Anna. So it was just like, boom. And then the second child, which was me, um, I, I was named Kiriaki, which is my dad's mother. It's my grandmother, my yaya. And she's my bestest friend in the whole wide world. She's so amazing. Um, yeah, K- Kiriaki was a very rare and prominent saint. She was the only child her parents were philanthropists. Her parents were um, very, um, you know, uh, dedicated themselves to the Lord. And um, yeah, she just has, she has an amazing, an amazing story that maybe we can share now or sometime. But um, so, but my mom in America, she didn't want people uh, making fun of me, you know, um, and she just wanted me to have a more normalized name. So they named me Katie. And so in school growing up, um, you know, people in the school system, they would call me Katie. And at home, like my cousins and my my siblings, they would call me Kiki, Kiki. And um, they'd all make fun of me, Kiki, Kiki. <laughs> and I think like that meant like toilet or something. So they would make fun of me and be like, you know, you're a toilet. <laughs> and, I was, and I got teased and made fun of when I was a kid. But yeah, Kiriaki, um, is a traditional saint name, a very rare, prominent saint. She dedicated herself to the Lord. And um, 
she didn't have any gentleman suitors. She wasn't interested in what all the other girls in her town were interested in. So in a reference, a visual reference of a modern day, it reminds me of Belle from like Beauty and the Beast, where she was just really eloquently into books and research and reading and really into her family and praying with the Lord. And so what happened was um, in the town over, there was this, um, the son of a king, and he was interested in Kiriaki, and she wouldn't have it. And this guy got everything he wanted. And so he ended up um, beheading her parents because he couldn't um, have her. And he thought by doing that, it would it would show it would show her that he could have what he wanted. And she still didn't. So then he had her decapitated. Oh, my stars. Yeah, she was very young. She's she's a martyr. She's a martyr. <laughs> yeah, and, and well, not only is she a martyr, but she stood true to her ideals, which I think is it's an incredibly brave and independent thing to do, especially for a young woman at such a young age. And it's interesting to me to hear how many parallels there are with you, with your dedication to philanthropy and your dedication to giving to others. You, you really, in many ways, are, are, are very much like your namesake, which I think is just wonderful. I agree on a soul level. I'm very into the spirit. I'm very into the soul. Thank you for recognizing and saying that. Um, you know, when, when it all came and I was educating and, and learning all about it, I saw a lot of connections and also it was like, wow, it's like a martyr. That's like, you know, literally it's like a death threat. Cause it's, it's something to live up to like, a, like, like to be named after a saint. It's like, it's, it's something to a uh, responsibility. It's an honor. It's a responsibility. And, you know, yes, I am really big into education and yes, I was always like, you know, out of all the Disney characters, you would say like Belle was, you know, it's like the beauty and the beast and Belle in her West wing with the rose and, you know, wearing yellow and, <laughs> and all that stuff. It's just, um, yeah, she's, she's a very special, um, important person. And, and, and that connects to my, Yaya, who, who's my grandma. So I have this history and I'm and connected in such a way that's just so, um, intimate, you know, and sacred, very, very sacred. Um, it's an honor. It's definitely an honor. Um, and yeah, just like, I love, like you said, like, you know, gifting to people and sharing with people and doing everything I can, but also like, you know, standing your ground and standing by what, what is important to me, whether it's weak or strong or right or right or wrong. It's just like, you know, with my moral compass, it's, um, yeah. It's, yeah. it feels like it's pointing due north. That's wonderful. <laughs> and it, it, it's funny, you and I have talked a lot ever since we met about how many things we appear to have in common, how many things align. And I just realized as you were talking about grandmothers being both being named Anna, both my grandmothers also had the same name, not Anna, but Rose. They were both, my maternal and paternal grandmother were both named Rose, coincidentally again. I love that name. So. I love the name Rose. When I was little, I just... I always thought like, oh, Rose, it was just so romantic and pretty. And um, there's that rose, that rose smell. And so growing up, I would always um, like have the rose lotions. And then my room growing up um, was mauve. And so um, like mauve and it's just, it's like divine, feminine, femininity, grace. And it's just like the rose. It always reminded me of my grandmother on my mother's side as well. And um yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing how many connections we have. So I know before we get into the whole year, you've been in movies and on television and we're, and I want to talk about that. I would love to talk a little bit more about you growing up in Detroit. I mean, well, we, again, oh, wait, wait, we, before yes. we move on uh -huh. to growing up in Detroit, let's, let's talk about, uh, um, so, uh, two things. One, uh, Katie, Katie was like, okay, there was Katie Holmes. There's like Katie Chinakis. That's me. It's like, K -k -k Katie, K -k -k Katie. <laughs> and so like growing up, like, um, all these elderly men and there was always some kind of like whimsical, soulful, like feel good thing about the name Katie. And like some people would be like, oh yeah, that's from, you know, um, the first world war, you know, it's, it, it made people happy. And it's like, just to hear that joyous moment of like, K -k -k Katie, K -k -k Katie. It was just like, it was always like a cool thing to, to be attached to um, growing up in the, you know, the essence of the universe. And then I remember, um, you know, this is fast forwarding, but it's in reference to the name. I remember when I was like, 
in California and I was sitting down with my team, they like actually sat me down. It was my manager and my, my uh, agent at the time, my first agent. And they like sat me down and they're just like, okay, like, you know what I mean? Like you need to cut your name. They're like, so I went by, instead of going by Katie Aki, um, you know, I, I went by Katie and then they wanted to like Chinakis, like they wanted to cut my name. They're like Johnny Depp, Woody Allen, Jennifer Aniston. I'm like, okay, we can do Katie, but we're not chopping off the Chinakis. Excuse my <laughs> language. Let's bleep that out. I am not like, there we go. Draw the line. So I, so when I started in the Hollywood industry, um, my acting career, um, I registered as a SAG actor under, well, it was, it was Kiri Aki, but then when I talked to the team and my, they're like, okay, these, are, this is how your credits are going to be. They're like, you just need to make it very simple, like simplify so people can find you. So I'm like, okay, dumb myself down. And we also had a conversation about cutting my hair because it was past my crevice. And they're like, you know, they wanted me to cut my hair because it was so extremely long. And then the analogy of my manager at the time, she was like, this is what you do. When it's like when you apply to Harvard, you wear a suit, you dress present, you you comb your hair, you 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 look nice, you get into Harvard, then you wear the short sleeves and you show them that you have the tattoos and dye your hair green and you get the piercings and do all the wacky stuff. But like just getting into Harvard, just like you know what I mean. So th they use that same analogy in two thousand and five about like my hair and my name of getting into Hollywood to be like recognized, respected to kind of play along with the system that is just what it was at the time. And and that's interesting because I know that some of your credits are, are from Katie Sunday. So Chinakis also Kiriaki Sunday. Kiriaki Sunday. Okay. So Kiriaki in Greek. So Simera Denine Kiriaki. I just said today is not Sunday. Uh -huh. Um so my name, Kiriaki, not only is I'm named after a saint, it means God's day. It's, 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 the, it's Kiriaki means Sunday. Ah, I had no idea. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're, you're, you're always so, keeping straight and true, even if you modify it just a little bit, it sounds like everything still leads back to who you are. So before just Kiriaki, I was, yeah, going by, um, well, I went by Katie Coco for a while because I love Chanel and it was like Lady Gaga at the time, like Katie Coco. And then, and then when I was going by um, Kiriaki Sunday, because of the turmoil and the back and forth banter of everyone's opinion and your name and making it such a big deal, I went by Kiriaki Sunday. So I'm like, you know, for the, for the MFs who like cannot pronounce Kiriaki for some reason, then hey, that like, they can just call me Sunday. So I, I'm like, here, here you go, Kiriaki Sunday, 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 basically. It's Kiriaki, Kiriaki. <laughs> I'm like, here's a double whammy. <laughs> so I, I went by, yeah, Kiriaki Sunday for a while. I love that the Kiriaki uh, Sunday. Yeah, that's it's <laughs> it's a it's a great and also just a little just a little poke at the people who are like you should change your name. Well, no, <laughs> yeah. which is which is great. So so this idea of of being who you are, it sounds like it really you know through your yaya, your grandmother, and growing up, it sounds like you developed that idea pretty early. Can you talk a little bit about your early life in Detroit and what that was like as you began? all of these different streams that you're involved in. Sure. I mean, let's, let's see how young and la, how back we want to go. Um, I mean, something that came up, I mean, do you have an idea of what age or, I mean, some, well, I something think, came up if you just want to roll with that. What do I you think, think what, to me, what, what I think is fascinating about you. Well, I think many things are fascinating about you, but I think this, this, full creative spark that seems to burn in you all the time. That sounds like it started pretty early. I mean, I know you started modeling as a teenager and you started acting and you started doing all these different things, but something before that must have sparked you. That that creative genius must have bubbled up earlier than that. And I'd love to know about that. This is after all the Creative Mindset podcast. So, so this idea of what inspired you to become an artist must have started pretty early. And I'd love to talk about that to begin with. Well, my birthday's 1111. So I was just born on 1111. I was born on my dad's birthday. So, you know, the the reference in my mind is like, um, you know, I was his gift. I was the best gift like he'll ever have, like to have a child born on your birthday. I mean, I, I mean, that would be such a magnificent gift. So I think with the alignment of 1111, um, the universe, God, 
already had stuff in store for me, which is awesome. And if people are in the ideal of choosing our lives before we actually come here, I guess I set myself up for this as well <laughs> to be um, um, uh, special, but I'm not special, the chosen one, <laughs> um, 11, 11. And then so just from my birthright and just being named after a saint and just having these amazing um, things, I guess, being identified with, you know, my, my little soul being a very, very young, my mother, um, was a singer. And, um, so, um, I come from a musical family and I grew up on Motown and melodies and feel good music. And I think it really enriched my spirit and my soul. And we would drive every Sunday to church, 45 minutes to St. Clair Shores to St. Spirit on St. Spirit on, excuse me. And, uh, I try to roll my, my uh, tongue for you guys to sound cool, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, that's the name of my dad's baseball team too, St. Spirit on. So we would grow when I was a child, we would grow up, you know, with the whole family and we would drive 45 minutes each way to go to church because, um, there's the new calendar, the old calendar. And our family was very strict by the original old calendar, which is a 14 day difference than, you know, the King James or the man-made um, calendar. Um, and so listening to, you know, the melodies and the music, I think that definitely had an influence on me, um, you know, growing up with culture. And, you know, I think that really had a cool, um, you know, um, impact on me growing up. Um, we have, there are these things back in the day, they were called uh, VHS tapes. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> yeah. And so I remember, um, you know, um, growing up, we would watch these VHS tapes and um, it would be little me, little me with um, blonde hair with this long broomstick and we'd be singing like, Bon Jovi and my mom would play records all the time. And so like we would just be singing and playing records and I had this long broomstick. And so I always like identified as an entertainer, as um, you know, someone who would use my voice, liked being in the spotlight, liked holding that broomstick. And so I've always like pondered through my years, like of that image and you know, that, that I see of that video, like was I, a, you know, a born star? Was I born into singing? Was I born into maybe whole, was that broom a mic doing stand up? Is that mic just being a, a, a role model in life? Like just being the center of attention on a stage, on a platform to, you know, just be in entertainment. So, um, you know, that's, that's circled my mind from time to time, but that's probably like my earliest memory of, of um, entertainment. It was, it was me singing with that broomstick <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So that broomstick took you into what? Did you go straight into performing like in school? Did you begin modeling out of that? Did you begin to DJ out of that? Where it can you trace for me where you went next as far as your creative endeavors? Yeah. So anytime I got an opportunity to take arts, you know, in school, I would um I would, I would always be like very uh, fashionable going to school. I remember when I was in elementary school, um, I lived on Wildwood and we would walk to school. I would go to the school called Edison Elementary School. And um, there were like, you know, like the different times, ki kinds of people. And um, there was this girl, there were like the popular girls and like we, you know, did some routines together to audition to be in a talent show. And, you know, it's like, it was so good. And then, and then we didn't get picked and I was absolutely devastated. Um, yeah, I, I actually went into like isolation after that. I was always getting detention. Like I could never go out and play with people because I was always getting times tables. Like I was sitting in a cube and I wasn't able to go out in the sun and have recess with everyone. I was isolated. Like I was punished. I was punished in school for like being who I was. And, um, you know, the class clown was this guy named Ryan and, um, you know, it was really weird. I remember like Mrs in like fourth grade or something. There was like Mrs. Sosnick. There was Mrs. Summer. She was my first grade teacher. There was Mrs. And then um, I remember like Mrs. I always wear these like black leather skirts and like there was like quiet time. And if like someone was the class clown, which was Ryan, she would 
oddly and weirdly have him come sit on her lap and i'm just like okay and it would everyone would be giggling and i'm like this is freaking whack and he just got this special attention in a weird way it was it was really weird i know and um yeah so but i would always get scolded and like you know be put in a corner and um and so for me for me being me so a lot of times my personality who I was, my big personality, my wild or happy personality was, you know, not comfortable for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I I just wrote down this thing yesterday. I was writing it's, um, there was this woman, she questions, what's one of the things you hold back? And, and I wrote down, I specifically, it's like on my table and I wrote down, um, being loud and wild, like, like letting out this, like, wild thing or like being loud because it's a inconvenience for others and then Mm -hmm. it's like it's like okay for those one or x amount of people that it's inconvenient for what about all the people over eight god willing all the over eight billion people in the world who need to hear your laughter who need to hear your wildness who need to hear your wackiness who need to hear how loud you are you know what i mean like i was always meant for greatness and i was always meant to be to be loud yet this like things like that at a young age like definitely plant a seed for, for, you know, traumatization. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, wait, I was going to tell you something. Well, it was in reference to, before I went off on this whole, like detention this thing, it was like, Oh, Oh, in seventh grade, I was, um, I love rock and roll in middle school. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the first time I was ever on TV. I have not seen the footage. I definitely want to. It was public TV. The um, talent show was recorded. I was in seventh grade. I did Joan Jet. I love rock and roll. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And my friend let me borrow his black, like traditional dope leather jacket. Everyone wore, it was like two girls in the back. They were like my background girls with like the guitars and this girl, Jessica, and this other girl. And, um, that we yeah I had like holes in my jeans and I just like rocked it it was amazing and I and, and not to be like you know but it was it was like I feel like the best best show and best performance um of the talent show but it, it um it was it was really cool so that that was a talent show that I was in in seventh grade um that I was able to perform in like oh the one in the one in middle school I have to get the name for you of the of the song it's 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 uh, I think maybe it's like the S is for super and the U is for unique. The P is for perfection and you know that we are freaks. The E is for erotic and the R is for rats. So tell us on the minds in this and all that supersonic, dun, 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 supersonic, dun, dun, dun. It, it, it was that song. So maybe it was the words that maybe didn't get us selected, but I mean there were no swear words in it. But it was three of us. It was Karina Debus and this other girl, Aaron. Um, it was the three of us. Uh-huh. Oh, oh yeah. So like we auditioned for the, the talent show with, with, I think with that song. And then, so, so they, so that was like, um, middle school walking to Edison and like that realm. And then another realm was this girl and she lived down the street from me and her name was, <laughs> and people would go, <laughs> and oh, we would, no. yeah. And like, <laughs> like donkey, but, mm-hmm. and so like she she like smelled and she um i don't know if like she had friends or not but like people would make fun of her and it was uncomfortable and so like not publicly but secretly like i would go and befriend her and i would talk to her and like only one time i went over there i'm like i'm, I'm like i want to help you you know like um so on the dl without anyone knowing you know cuz like at the time you like don't want to be associated with someone or like you know, it's like kids are very like cruel and mean, you know, but so like publicly, I don't remember, but publicly maybe like in school, I shamed her or said things just being a, an ignorant little child or maybe I did, maybe I didn't, I don't know. But I I remember I wouldn't like befriend her in public or at school, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but like we, I think we like trailed on the way, the same way home together because she lived by me. So at some point I was able to like talk with her and I was like, listen, cause she dressed like all wacky and stuff. And I went to her house. I only did it one time, but I went to her house 
And like, I helped her like organize her looks and I open, I organized her closet and I like, I cut her hair. I did her makeup. She didn't have a mom. I guess her mom passed away and like, she only had a dad. So it makes sense if like she, she's not very hygienic or she's not too into like, you know, hygiene and like beauty and like fashion and clothes and stuff or whatever issues the girl had at the time. I don't know. But for me, it was like a, like a personal like pet project to like take her and transform her. And I did. And she went into school and I, I, I'm sure she had better confidence because I know I remember like people like seeing and looking at her in a way that was like, oh, like that or Ooh, like that. So I think I like helped her in a way. So on a psychological level, like if you take all of this now, it's like, I've always had a love for f- fashion. I've mm-hmm. always had a love for helping people. Mm-hmm. So like at a very young age, you know, I was like, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade or something. I like took this girl who was like, who, who, or whatever she was at the time. And I, you know, she invited me into her home and I, I helped her and I like, kind of like just showed her some things. So yeah. <laughs> it's so, it, and it's, you know, it's interesting how, changing something about yourself, no matter what it is, can really boost your confidence. And so much of that kind of presentation as far as how you present yourself to your peers when you're in school, particularly, you know, as as a young child, nine or 10 years old or 11 or 12, if, if you can, if you can present yourself more confidently, it can change everything. And I'm sure that part of the work that you two did together was to help her boost her confidence in herself and in what, you know, in, in, in what she could do and in who she was. And I think that that can make all the difference if you're at that tender young age of nine or 10 years old. So it's really cool and wonderful that you were able to do that for her. And you learned something about yourself too, that you wanted to help people, you know, in, in that way when you were nine and in so many other ways as, as you've grown as a, as a person and as a performer, as an artist. And yeah, two things. One, um, it also gave me the like incentive and and passion for fashion. So like ever since then, I always had because of that seed that developed ever since then, like when I was in California or just being like in the fashion world with fashion friends and just like loving fashion, I would be like um, in Los Angeles or just like anywhere and be like, oh, okay. So that person just needs to do that. Or like that, that like all of this looks good, but this is off. And I always wanted to have like my own TV show where I would like go up to people and like do a transformation thing. And it'd be like a fun thing to help them, even though it's direct and abrupt at first and people like don't want to hear it. Or it's just like, oh, like I didn't, I didn't expect you to attack, you know, and everything is like, oh, that's superficial. Cause it's just like, the outside, but they say a lot about like, you know, what we wear on the outside is like how we're feeling on the inside. So I always was excited to like have a transformational TV show about fashion where I took people who like wanted to improve or people that didn't know, and then you take them and you transform them. So I always, and I think that developed because of, of helping her in that situation. It was just it was awesome to really see someone do to be where they were and then go through that transformational progress. Now it'd be really cool to God willing, the girl's alive and healthy. Like, I mean, it would be really interesting to, you know, sometimes connect with people. So in this situation, connect with people and be like, how was that for you on a psychological level? Like, um, did it hinder you? Did it make you grow? Like, do you honor and respect me? Like, do you hate me? Like, like, how was that for you? Cause it was an important time in my life. And sometimes people are like, Oh no, it wasn't an important time in my life. But I think in this situation, because of her circumstances, I think it was probably a monumental time for her, um, you know, to take some initiative and, and have some basic tools, but don't you ever wonder what it'd be like to like connect with people that you haven't spoken to in a while and be like, Hey, like, how you doing? Or like, um, this is where you were. And this is, this is how you are now. <laughs> Absolutely. And in fact, that's one of the things I love about social media is that it's allowed us the opportunity to do just that. You know, I have become dear friends once again with my best friend from fourth grade. And it's because we're, we, we met up on social media and there are so many people that I have found or who have found me over time because of social media that, that we have been able to reconnect and, and find out, you know, there, I'll be honest, there, there are, I, I have been told things by former teachers who I've connected with on social media and by friends from way back 
about impacts that I had on their lives. And I've been able to tell them about impacts that they've had on me because of this. Like, for example, my books, when I've written, I dedicate my books to my one of the people I dedicated to is always Linda Gutman, who was my sixth grade English teacher, because without her, Aww, that's I, so sweet. I know she's one and she's wonderful, wonderful teacher. But it's because without her, I would not have had the interest in reading or writing that I developed. So I owe her such a great debt. And so it would be really cool if you were to be able to find this person and and see you know how you both because she impacted your life greatly because it really sparked your interest in this idea of self transformation whether it's through fashion or through something more spiritual it doesn't matter what matters is that it sparked that that desire for you to help yourself and to help others achieve that and it would be really wonderful to see what it did for her and see what the parallels are i think that i think we'd be surprised at how many there would be actually so, so what, yeah. So what I want to say now is thought form. So it's like, I've thought, I've thought about this. Like mm -hmm. I, I probably can't tell you how many countless times I thought about this. The number of times I actually told the story, like literally you might be the second person to ever know this. And wow. so for me to like say it out loud on a podcast is like on your podcast is, um, you know, very like, um, open and vulnerable and it's cool. It's, it's fine. Um, but yeah, like this is the second time probably I've ever said this, but now that I've said it out loud and now that I heard what you just said, now it's like okay then it's taking action and putting it on a train track and actually you know being the responsible one and and since this is of interest and in, an idea of mine for me because I have a Facebook account to type in her name and me reach out to her and be like hey how are you like like I can't expect a lot of people I think they expect like oh it's thinking and ruminating in my head and then it'll come up one day or people will contact you no it's 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 what I'm thinking about um it's it, what if I were the person to look her up and find her and say, hey, you know, and so now it's like that new seed is planted where I could actually connect the dots in, in that way. Absolutely. And it's a it's a it's a per, it becomes a personal call to action, you know, because you took your path from that moment and she took her path from that moment. So I'm sure it would be fascinating to find out what that led to for her and compare to what it led to for you, you as the giver in this situation and her as the receiver. And I think we do combine those things. Sometimes, you know, you, you gave something to her, but you also received something. You received this interest, this desire to help that you might not have been aware of before that. And she also gave and received. So it'll be great to see where she is now and, and how her life has gone from that moment forward. I would love to hear that story. That would be really cool. Yeah. The last thing I'll say about this too is like the division, you know, like one, it's like wanting to be popular with, you know, the popular girls at school. And then the other split is like, like, I want to befriend this girl and talk to her, but not at school and not around anyone like secretly. So it really said a lot about my character, about how immature I was. I was embarrassed or um, like I, 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 what if I was the person to actually befriend her in front of everyone? What if I was the person, you know, you see it in the movies or some people are like that, you know, but what if I was like, it, it was kind of like mean girlish of me and very like mean spirit of, of me and like kind of conniving in a way too. So, so we looked at the evolved part, but if we looked at the devolved part of the personality, it's, you know, kind of secretive, but you know, I was a kid and I, I didn't know. And, you know, so you just, you don't want to be associated with, with certain things or whatever, what was going on in my mind at the time. But, you know, I, I recognize that and I could see that pattern, you know, through, through my life as well. So that's something to really acknowledge to, you know, um, improve character, you know, and for us, because around that is bullying, the bullying and, and why people bully and the bully who's getting bullied and, you know, like, okay, let's say it's not all about here, but let's say a, a child goes to the school and they're being picked on. And you don't know what's happening in their home lives. And, you know, I never saw her father or, you know, what was going on in her home life. I just knew she didn't have a dad, but what about like the people who go home and they get bullied by their parents or their siblings and the bully at school is being bullied at home, you know? So Nikki um, is amazing. Nikki Scorpio, my music partner and a partner in many ways. He um, wants to create this nonprofit called There's No Such Thing as Bullies, you know, with 
the eradication of what I just said of like the bullies being bully, like who's bullying the bully, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot to what you just said, this idea of owning the shadow self, you know, there's nobody alive who doesn't have a shadow self. I don't know who they, I don't, I don't care who you are. Everybody has the, the, the more sort of dark and less, less uh, into the light impulses. We all have them and hopefully we recognize them and keep, keep growing and, and working through them. And so you as a young child, you, you may not have behaved the way that would have been your best self, but it was your best self at the time. And your best self at the time went, okay, I'm not quite ready to, to, to do this publicly, but I can help her privately and, and lift her up, you know, and raise yeah. her. So, so there's there, yes, there is a part of this is who's, you know, who's bullying the bullies, but the person being bullied doesn't, you know, in that moment when you're being bullied, I'm not sure that you, that you have the wherewithal to go, oh, I wonder who's bullying you, who are my bully. It, it's more like all we can do is experience what we're experiencing and, and, and every day and every way try to do better, whatever that is for each individual person. You know, the, I mean, the, we can, we can talk about the psychology of that for yeah. a long time, but ultimately I do think it ends up being about trying to do better, you know, like everybody, I, I, I wrote this down in my journal the other day. I'm like, everybody screws up. You screw up, acknowledge it and then do better next time. And that's, that's what you can do. You know, there's no way we're going to not screw up. We are all going to screw up, but the key is to figure it out, acknowledge it, and then attempt to do better the day after and the day after that. And every minute, you know, try to do better, try to be better. And that's what you did. And I think that's, that to me is crucial and critical in personal growth, in self evaluation and, and really, you know, the sort of what they call self-actualization, really knowing who you are and being purposeful in your life. And you've done that in many ways and you've taken your interests and created those kinds of really fascinating streams of, of, of art and creativity. And that's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to talk to you a little bit about some of these uh, some of these paths that your creativity has taken, because you took your interest, for example, in fashion, and you and you began modeling for Macy's, for Nordstrom's, mm -hmm. for T-Mobile. You were in magazines and things like that. When you did that, it must have opened up a whole new world for you. What was that like? So, um, from the get in Michigan, there. Um, was an agency called the talent shop and uh, Mary Fashoni, she became my first gem. So I refer to people who I admire as gems and I always try to meet and befriend uh, as many gems as possible. And, um, and Mary Fashoni, she's amazing. And um, yeah, so she was an agent at the talent shop. Now she has her own agency in Michigan. It's in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and she has her own agency. Um, do you want to know the name of it? Uh, sure, if you'd like. Absolutely. Oh, it's called Unique Models and Talent. So she um, has her own agency now in Michigan. For all the local Michiganders, hit up Mary Fashoni. Tell her Katie Chinaka sent you. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. She's great. She's great. Mr. F, I call him Mr. F, Mr. Fashoni. They were in, she has four kids and now she's a, a grandmother. Jeez. I mean, her oldest had, I think, six children. So she's like has 12 grandkids. And it's wild because when I was, you know, a kid in Michigan, I just looked up to her and her her blue sparkle and twinkle in her eye and her smile and her glow. And she was just so graceful. And she shared bits of information about her dad and, you know, her sisters. And, um, you know, she invited me into her home in Michigan. Um, and it's just, she's, she's amazing. So I've always looked at her as a role model, a, a, like a family figure of something, what I desire and aspire to be and grow into. Um, her um, second um, eldest, um, she went to school for writing in Chicago for journalism. And I always thought like, wow, that's like really cool. Like, could you imagine or could I imagine 
going to school for journalism, you know, it's because obviously like, you know, writing is a desire and passion uh, of mine. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I, uh, she was an agent and I was a teenager and I would be booked on these modeling jobs in Michigan. And in Michigan, I started off as a promo model. So they're like promotions, Mm -hmm. like a promo model. So I would go to these different places. Some were, you know, mid huge or mid size events. And it would be like me and like three or four other promo models. And we'd be handing out things for like Pantene Pro V Mm -hmm. (laughs) or handing out, you know, whatever they wanted us to hand out. And like, and then I would get checks and I would just like get this money and it would be good money for being a teenager and, you know, having these checks and starting off as a model. And, um, that's how I started. And then, you know, um, that's like the in-between of the auditions and then the the modeling and the comp cards and getting booked on like Somerset Collection, which is a huge mall in Troy, Michigan. And they booked me, you know, on their catalog and like this company called Donor. It's a huge uh, catalog company for, you know, snowboarding and skiing and stuff. And, you know, I booked their campaigns. And so I do this, these catalog works. And, and so that's how I kind of started going with the whole modeling thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and catalog, um, print jobs, they pay a lot more than like runway shows. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, with my face, I have a very like Gucci Versace kind of face. I love Calvin Klein. I love because it's like, the symmetry and it's simplistic and it's like really sophisticated and chic, but with a rock star edge. And I feel like that really defines uh, my personal style, um, you know, of like, you know, uh, like really heightened um, sophistication with like, like an edge, like, you know, rock star ish. And so, you know, like the monies were really good for catalog work. Um, and I really desired for, high fashion modeling to Mm -hmm. be, you know, on the runways and, um, and booking those editorial and campaigns that, you know, the, I guess you would call supermodels would be booking. And, um, you know, it was, so it was very unfortunate because I heard from the beginning, you know, your height, your height, your height, and I'm such a rebel without a cause. And it's like, you can be, have all these heightened emotions and these passions, but then also like you have to, use the, you know, other part of the logical part of the brain, which is, it's not you personally, but the reason why they go for the quote unquote models, human beings to be five, nine, it's not because of the model. Like that's only, that's, that's like, okay, that's, that's a whole palette of pickings. But first and foremost, it, like the number one thing statistically, like factually is the height and the shape, the size, because it's all about the clothing. And for some reason, right. the standard, it's not for some reason, there's a reason why, um, you know, there's the standard for the the fit of the clothes is for, you know, a model, um, a human being who is taller, it makes the clothes look better. It, right. it may, you know, and they're looking to sell the clothes, um, the, the clothes, that's what they're looking to sell the brands, the fashion brands, houses are looking to sell the clothes. So, I mean, it's a rare thing and, you know, with the world and ever changing, you know, society that you get someone like, um, Emma from Lord of the Rings, where she's like the model for Burberry and she's probably like shorter than I am, but she's a celebrity in the movie. So then they obviously fit the clothes to her and make her look long because it is possible. But traditionally, like this is like the recipe for the soup. So I was told from the get, like, this is how it was going to be. But I knew my destiny and I knew how big I was in so many ways on so many platforms. But I made it difficult for myself because, um, you know, I, I had this passion for modeling and then mm-hmm. through it was, am I vain? Am I so vain that I know I look so good? It's just, it's superficial. It's just a look. No, it, it comes with the art. It comes with the passion. It comes with the whole package of, of what's going on inside of me. But the thing is, it was very, it was very, and I did book work along the way, but, um, it was very challenging and very difficult. And so there, there became a point, it was probably in, um, 2007, I remember I had a, a boyfriend at the time and like I was in LA and I literally drove like 
two hours south to OC for an audition. And I'm at this audition and there's like 300 people there. And I remember texting back and with them forth. And I'm just like, it's like, I just want to throw in the towel. Like, I don't want to put myself through the ringer anymore. But sometimes we do, even though, cause, cause we have a love and passion. So sometimes we do things we don't want to do. And, and then he, he just, he just said to me, it was just cause he's on the outside of it. He's like, he's, he's just like, baby, you don't have to do that anymore. Or like, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. And at that point, I'm just like, I'm not driving two hours and sitting with 300 people for an audition ever again. And even being in LA, just like to get ready to park your car, to have your book, to sit at an audition with like, you know, a hundred girls or 200 girls. I'm like, I'm not interested in doing that either. Like, like I am not 15 anymore. I am not, you know, 19. Like I don't have this much time to waste for an mm -hmm. audition to go into a room with a line of people or to go into a room. And there's like a, a, a table of people sitting there and they look at your book and they're like, thank you. Or like next or something. And it's like, you just, you, you feel like, like you're nobody or nothing. Or if they're in the room giving special attention to another girl, it makes you feel really insecure and it makes you feel like horrible inside. Well, it made me feel that way because I'm wanting the attention. I'm wanting them to like me. I'm wanting to get booked on the job. I'm wanting to be the campaign. I'm wanting to be the face. I'm, I'm wanting to connect. And so a lot, there was a lot, that's why they say you have to have like a tough skin because there's a, there's a lot of rejection and I'm like, oh, I can handle the rejection. I can handle it. And I have, and I have, I've handled a lot of rejection. I really have. Um, it's just, yeah, I choose not to do that. So then, so then along the way I switched up my game with my people and I'm like, yo, like if they're looking for like a young Demi Moore type or a young Brooke Shields, or they know me, or if they see my card and I'm a special request, I'll go in. So if it's like me and like five girls or 10 girls or something, I'll go in, but I'm not going on these catacalls where there's going to be so many people. Like I just don't have the patience or the time for it. And I don't want to put myself through the emotional ringer. Um, so that's some of my modeling career. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's it's fascinating because it takes it takes knowing yourself really well, it, it, it seems to me to go, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to go to cattle calls. I don't want to be someone who is one of 300 people. If well, I if wanted they, to, you know, I wanted to, I no, I, I still wanted to, I still wanted to do it. I still wanted to model. I still wanted to be book. I still wanted the things I wanted. And I still like knew I could do it, but then yeah, like taking yourself off from, from actually doing it. Like definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not that the desire for doing it went away. It's the, des it seems to me like the desire for being one of 300 for having yeah. to, for, for, you know, it's like, look, if they want me, I feel that way about voiceover work. If they want me great. If, if I'm one of hundreds trying to audition for one spot, I'm not that interested in it, you know? So, so that, and it's, and that's in some ways, that's the game you decide to play. If you decide to play the game of numbers, then you will audition, audition, audition in, in every which way. And if you decide to play the sort of, well, I want to be someone that they have listened to and want me specifically, then it's a different, then it's a different ball game. You know, it's a different kettle of corn. Definitely. So, yeah. So it feels like that it helped you evolve into the next phase. And so was the next phase producing or acting? Well, well, hold on. I want to share a bit more on this. Oh, so, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, through the years, so many people have come up to me and they're like, oh my God, start your own modeling agency, start your own agency, start your own agency. And like, um, I'm such an artist head that like, obviously you would get a partner and they would help you do the things that you don't know how to do, like the business side of it. Mm -hmm. But like, I just, I didn't have that, like, I didn't, I never took that leap to, to go and do that because it's like, if I go and do that, I know what it's like to be on the other side, i.e. being the artist and getting mm -hmm. the whatever 20% <laughs> and then, and then managing people and, and all that. Like, and, it, and I knew it would take, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want the responsibility. And I knew it would take me away from me being an artist for myself. Cause like you just said, I'm involved in so many other things. So I, I never took that approach, although it could be like something I could have done. It just, I didn't have a deep desire and passion for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, so what I did actually not too long ago, um, because I would get all these like kids and 
peers and moms and a lot of moms, a lot of parents um, wanted me to like manage their children and help them out and give them information. And then I am saying the same thing over and over in so many different ways. And yeah, I love helping people and I love sharing my experience thus far. And I love giving basic rules of how things are because I've been in the industry now for like, you know, two decades, thankfully. And um, so what I did was with the whole YouTuber thing, you know, going on, uh, my friend, Alessandra Levy, who's also my producing partner. Um, she produced a series of episodes where they're like basic one oh one. So now like, um, one of the one oh ones is, um, model one oh one. So like that can be great for people I don't know. And people who come to me, I can, you know, have them watch the video. And after they watch the, the video and digest it, okay, now I can answer any questions you may have. Mm-hmm. So, so to conserve my time and my energy, because it's like, it's a lot, right? If you're saying the same thing over and over. So also, um, like I just got a couple emails, you know, within the last couple of weeks, I got three different emails of, um, of an introduction. Mm -hmm. This is so-and-so, they're 18 years old, they just got out of school, they're a dancer, they, uh, you know, want to make supplemental income, Um, you know, um, well, not with what's going on, obviously, right now in the world, because we're all, you know, inside, but this is the time to start doing the research and and, um, preparing yourself for when you can set yourself up to go have a photo shoot or test shoot or meet these people. And all, a lot of the agencies now, um, some of them still have open call like a Wednesday, three to four or a Monday or whatever. And it's an hour where you can just go in and like show them your book or just some snapshots. They prefer just snapshots, really. They just prefer just snapshots. They just want to see how you look on snapshots because if they're interested, they put you with their photographers and they do a test shoot, which means you don't have to pay anything. And then it comes out of your first check or something, or they just have a relationship with the in-house photographer at the agency. So it's like a, it's a working system that works for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, so yeah, so I got this email and I, and I, and I, and I responded and in, in, in the response, she already had, she already had the link. And in the response, um, I said this, this, and this. And one of the, the very first things I said, one of the very, and I kept it short, but one of the most important thing, I didn't say the most important thing, but the thing is, it's like, please send me three to five photos of you. So I can see like what I'm dealing with. Like, I can't say anything unless I like see what, what, what the, what the product is or who the human is, what's going on. Right. So she, so she wrote me back, um, this, this thing and she didn't, she didn't include a photo. So I responded, uh, could you please send some photos? So she sent, she sent me a couple photos and this girl, I like, she's so sweet and stuff, but she's, she doesn't look like a model at all. Like she does not look at a model, like at a model at all. And if I'm super direct, it's going to hurt people's feelings. But like, that's why people were saying, oh, have your own agency or like, I'm go to what I do, but like, I don't have to, I, it's not like nitpicking something, but because of this, like it's not happening. Um, it, it doesn't even matter for me to say this thing. Like I'm not even going to say on here. It doesn't even matter that thing because the girl's like five, three. And it's, it's, if I'm like five, five <laughs> and this girl's five, three, and I had challenging times, it's like, what kind of modeling do you want to do? Because right. me, I particularly wanted to do high fashion and it was like very difficult. Mm-hmm. So, um, I was able to do, work on some projects and we can talk about how that happened. Um, but for the most part, it, you know, you're 18 years old and you're, you have all this ambition and you're a dancer. The best bet for you is to, do you want to do commercials too? Get with the commercial agency to do on-screen commercials. And then they have a print division, more agencies like A3, it formerly Abrams Artist Agency, Osbrink, CESD, um, these kind of agencies where they have a, um, a commercial division, they also have a voiceover division, but if they have a commercial division, they have this print division where it's not like high fashion models. It's more of like lifestyle or sometimes the, re- I think the reason why, I don't know for sure, but a lot of times I know when they hire you for a commercial, mm-hmm. they can take still shots from that and they can also have a still photographer on set. So sometimes up front, they know they're like, this isn't on, this is an on screen commercial, but this is going to be a part of the print campaign too. So then you have like two deals in one. So with your height, And your look and you're a dancer. Also, there's Clear Talent Group and there's Block, which is an agency, BLOC. You know, if you're a dancer, you might want to get with the dance agency that has like an on screen commercial division um, so you can get hired in some of like the print stuff. But it, the, 
it's very slight. It, and that, that's I'm talking about if you do it through the industry way of an agency. Mm-hmm. Now there's um, that, there, so that's the A tier. And me, because of who I am and how I was raised and my morals and my values and, and how I see myself and, and where I position myself, I, that's, what, that's the only way I would do it. There's you know, the different tiers of B tier agency, C and D and E, and then complete F, which is, I guess, more of the, the, the B and C tiers are agencies like maybe, um, um, there's like MMG and they're in Canada and everything. And and they have some celebrity people or influencers or something, but then they have like people who aren't the, the, the height of a, of a high fashion model and, and people who are different, um, you know, heights and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's like model mayhem or Craigslist. And those are like complete, like whack, like, and those are, there's no, there's no contracts and laws um, and protection through an agency for someone to do your deal. So you're throwing yourself there as an artist and you may be treated a certain way because they don't know protocols of being professional. So right. then you may never get paid. Like I've heard, I haven't heard a lot of stories, but I know there's a lot of stories out there of, you know, being touched or sexually abused or oh manipulated or, you know, horrible situations because pe- people take and prey on the desperation of people wanting you know, to be a star or be like a model and they just have the ego of being a model and they just want to be having this attention because, you know, they're, they're just needing this attention that they never got or, or they're wanting to feed that star need. So yeah, you have to be very careful. And, um, that's why I say only go through an agency, um, no matter how big or small, because then you have that, that, that kind of like equilibrium of that balance and support. Sure. And, and, and an extra layer of sort of protection, you know, for, for, for you and for the work you do, which I think is really important. Definitely. Definitely. So so as part of the work you did in LA, did you stay in LA the entire time you were a model and an actress, or did you end up going on location to places? Um, I, well, I've always been by coastal in Mm -hmm. LA and New York. So, um, I even like ventured and be like, oh yeah, I'm tri-coastal over the pond, London. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've always been um, bi-coastal, um, which I love. Um, but yeah, um, I did this campaign in Hawaii uh, for Mosley Tribes. That was really cool. Um, that was a really cool experience. And honestly, um, that was through knowing somebody. So when you get certain opportunities, it's really important if you have the height or you don't have the height that you have, um, you know, a network of people that, um, can support you, um, to gift you opportunities. Um, but yeah, that was definitely through someone that I knew that was an opportunity. And even that wasn't easy because it's not only when you know someone, if, if someone's the creative director, you know, they have to want you and, you know, they have to be like, yes or no. They actually call the shots. There's so many people involved when it comes to the decision-making. It's like, it's, and it's confusing and it's difficult and it's overwhelming. And it's, I mean, it can leave an individual like really confused and lost, you know? So it's, it's really important to know who's who and not be scared of like, oh, this is the crew. This is lighting. This is hair. This is makeup. This is a creative director. This is the client. Like you have to know who's who and be educated and be professional because a lot of times people I've been on set with eight other models and we did this commercial for and it was a weekend they had a holiday budget. <laughs> they had a holiday budget they, that, that, that money they needed to blow. And there was eight models on set. And at the end, you know, we all did our contracts in the beginning, but at the end, when we're going to like sign our contracts or like fill out the, the rest of the contract, um, the client is putting it down as one commercial. It was a Sunday. My agent was at the beach. I text her right away. I said, yo, I'm like, I saw the storyboards. There's like eight commercials going on here and they're trying to pay everyone for one commercial. Wow. She came to set. She came to set in Hollywood and she talked to the AD guy and the AD guy who was like full of himself because he was only, he made it apparent that he was only taking this job because his, because he just finished some big movie with somebody and normally he just works in the feature film world. But like he's an AD and he doesn't want to lose his job. So he's just doing his job. But he's having eight talents sign a contract for one commercial when there were about eight commercials 
and all of us collectively, we were in four to six. So you get paid per each spot. Right. And so everyone, everyone got paid. One person said thank you to me. It's okay. I'm not looking for, you know, the gratification, but my agent and I, I mean, she was very grateful and we went and had a meal and we talked about it and we felt like these powerhouse ladies, because if it weren't for me on set being her eyes and ears, those uneducated talent people would have been working and not getting what they were supposed to be getting. Right. But you know, it's really funny that you say that, that, that they might not have even known to think about it. You know, what you said about being an educated artist, you know, that's so important. And being an educated business person when you're an artist is even more important because you can get taken advantage of because those other professionals would have not gotten their money at all in that way if you hadn't been professional yourself and gone hey this is what's going on i recognize this i know this is an industry standard we need to change this and then on top of that you took action and i think that is so important for artists to do because it is so easy for us to get lost in the creative aspect of what we do and forget that in addition to being creatives we also have to be business people we also have to keep our eyes on that bottom line yeah. So sometimes clients, they have like the story board up and sometimes clients, they like keep it secret. Like they don't put it up for everyone mm -hmm. to see. They keep it just between them, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it's a challenging spot for me as an artist because like, I want to be hired, you know, I want to work. And then also like, I can't, you know, say or make a stink. I had to like, you know, shoot over a text message because it has to be her that says something. It can't be me. I can't right. cause a confrontation on set in front of everyone and, and, and be pinned as the problem, you know? Right. No, and it's, when it's I was not your job. Doing, when I was just doing, when I was just doing my job. Yeah. Right. It, it's, that's, and I thing. had fun. It was a great day. It was awesome. And I'm like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's considered a holiday. It's a weekend. We're getting paid more because it's a holiday and it's a weekend. So like there's laws within the union. So this was, this was, um, like a model commercial job. So it wasn't just a straight model job because a model job has a certain contract, but no union affiliation, but certain right. model jobs that has a union affiliation where it's like model and commercial there, there are the union rules. So based right. on if you have experience or not exactly. So that's why it's really important to always be learning and not be like, Oh, I know it all on set or on stage or feel like, you know, it all. But like, if it is what it is, like, you know, call a spade a spade. Sure. And, and, you did it right when when you when you spoke up you didn't speak up to them you spoke up to the agent so you went through the proper channels yeah and that's that's important to know like a lot of people probably don't know and a lot of creatives probably don't know that there are channels to go through and that they need to know what those channels are in order to make sure that they are getting fairly compensated for the work they're doing yeah, I was heavily involved, um, not heavily, but I was getting more involved with SAG and I was wanting to like um, suggest to them and hey, let's have a, let's create a division because they have these different divisions. They brought in someone to explain social media. He ended up being slightly crooked <laughs> in a Oops. way. We won't get into that right now, but <laughs> um, but um, I was like wanting to suggest to you know, the union to have like, kind of, kind of like a, a spiritual guide or like a, like a, like a person who's for the actor, but the, the business side as well, who mm -hmm. like comes into a big set. If there's like 300 people on set or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, or even if it's like a smaller set to, to come in and let them know, like, these are the basic ground rules and this is what you need to know. So all the stuff that actors don't know, like mm -hmm. all the actors, Oh, like when you're on set, like, um, put on, put it, put, submit all these questions. Or if you're a model, like su submit all these questions and through the modeling, I know, um, this woman, Sarah Larson, who's a model, she created the model Alliance, which is really cool. So she's making a huge impact on, you know, the modeling world with, you know, more security and safety within, within models, um, within that industry. But for the union, which has that all in place, they need to have, like uh, these questions that are emailed in by the actors mm -hmm. say, hey, like, you know, so when you go, there's like a board or like, um, you know, a, like a chat room that they can go in and Q&A, Q&A, it's already there. Right. They can type it in and it's there. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably more uh, feasible and beneficial, actually, 
than probably like a human because like when you go to a set you have a line producer on set you have all the, the lighting the crew you have all these people on set so what if you have someone there who is like the person who mm-hmm. answers the questions for the actors because right. the only person that that's there is the PA who's checking you in and out and they don't know right they they do not know they just know what they're told and they just they follow the protocol through you know the the line and and some are friendly and some are not some are just like fill the paperwork out and go sit down or you know what i mean like unless mm-hmm. unless you're like a principal or the main person then then they're you know all cool and like you know cool with you but if you're not if you're an extra on set or if you're not one of the main people they just they don't they don't treat the actors i think um fairly all the time well and it's also good to have someone who has your interests at heart you know yeah that's the thing if you're an extra or if you're if you have you know even a featured role rather than the star you might not have anybody to represent your interests and it's a really good idea to at least know what those interests should be you know mm-hmm. what is it that that you need to be aware of and it's great that you were providing that for people did you do the same thing when you were on film sets that kind of awareness um film sets that i've been on where i'm the star or if i'm a principal leading role then you know i'm in my trailer i'm not with the other people. So I'm in a different mind frame because I'm working on my material and I'm, I'm focusing on my health and, and I'm enjoying being celebrated and honored for the hard work I've done. So I'm, I'm the star on the set. I'm not really, you know, out there, um, you know, with the, with the other actors and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Not yet. I haven't been, it's a good, it's a good thought for like the future, but I haven't, I haven't been in that position yet where I, where I felt that. Okay. So, so the work that you have done, like on CSI and it's always sunny in Philadelphia. And I know you've been in, in some movies like the code and, and, um, the movie with Nicholas Cage, bad Lieutenant. Yeah. Port of call yeah. New Orleans Port- with, um, Werner Herzog top, uh-huh. top like 35 filmmaker in the world. Yeah. Werner, he's amazing. He's so sweet. So, so describe those experiences. How was that to do? How were those roles different from, from some of the other creative endeavors that you've, that you've done? CSI New York was amazing. I worked with Gary Sinise and we did this, we did this scene. That's all my reel. And in between takes, he just, he just gave me the best compliment of my life. He's like, you're a very soulful actor. So I'm not acting. It's just, it, it just comes from my soul. You know, and oh, it was that's really, wonderful. yeah, it was really great working together. Um, so that was really cool. Um, <laughs> funny story, like on the set was, um, I had two brothers, two, they were my two brothers, like on the, on the episode and one name, one name, um, uh, Ryan Carell, he and I stayed in contact mm-hmm. and it's funny because his dad is Richard Carell, like the famous director, Richard Carell, who, oh, wow. was, yeah, he was best friends with Hugh Hefner. And, um, he has an amazing home in Hancock park and Hugh Hefner at the time would have four big parties at the playboy mansion every single year. And one was Mm -hmm. the Halloween party. And there would be all these amazing, like, um, you know, um, figures and they, he borrowed them from Richard Carell, Richard Carell owned them and he would borrow them for the Halloween party and they'd be brought in every year. Wow. But, but Mr. Carell actually owned them all, which is really interesting. Um, and then um, Ryan Corral, uh, his best friend, I don't know if they're still best friends, but his best friend at the time was Max Spielberg, which is Steven Spielberg's son. And it was um, Steven Spielberg's first son, Max Spielberg. Mm-hmm. So I, I was able to hang out with him a, a few times, you know, and kind of experience that energy. Um, but Ryan, I remember he and I, um, we went to Manhattan beach. I don't know if I had an audition there. We were in the same car, like we, and we were there and we were like sitting and we were talking and he's, he's a son of a director who directed, um, full house, sweet life of Zach and Cody, um, Hannah Montana with Miley Cyrus, like like he's directed some stuff. He's like the director for Disney. Well, at the time he was. Mm-hmm. And, and he, Ryan Carell, is asking me, 
And that's when it really hit me. That's when it really, really hit me in like 2005. I'm this girl from Michigan with no social connections in the industry whatsoever. And I go to California to do what I do and I'm doing what I'm doing. And in 2005, I was on CSI New York and I befriended Ryan Carell. And then, you know, we're developing our front, we're developing our friendship and we're sitting in Manhattan beach on the grass. And he's asking me, how do I do what I do? And he's asking me for advice about acting. And he's asking me advice about being in the industry and, and, and stuff. And I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, it was an honor and it was so sweet, but it was also like, this person is asking me when it's like, yo, why don't you have your dad put us on a TV show? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, uh, hello. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, that was just, that really hit me. That was in 2005 that that happened and that he shared that with me. And it, so it doesn't matter. Like if you have family in the industry, it doesn't matter if your mom or dad is this or that. And sometimes it does. And sometimes it helps. And some, a lot of times it helps. And a lot of times they're there and they're supporting, but there are family members who I guess don't support or share, or educate or help out, you know, their, their family members. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a real free for all because sometimes you have a lot of regret and resentment. Like, Oh, if I was a child star, or they were a child star, or, you know, like, Oh, this is their mom or dad. But sometimes not all people have that also. So it, it's right. definitely the person and, it has to be coupled with the talent and, and the mindset and the, the development of the mind growth and going after what you want and right. not letting anyone or anything stop you, no matter who they are, no matter if it's a family from family or friend member connected to the industry or not, you, you don't know. It's a free, it's a really free for all. Sure. It sounds like it. It sounds like there's a combination of factors and I think the desire for it certainly is one of them, but also having the talent for it. And if you know someone, that's great. But a lot of it ends up being, it sounds like, that sort of, it's almost a symbiosis. You can't have the one without the other. And, you know, with Ryan asking you questions, you come across as someone who knows. You know stuff, you know. That's, that's whether or not you do, and I think you do, but whether or not you do, you come across as someone who either knows the answer or who can figure out the answer. And so it's not surprising to me that he would ask you, hey, what, what should I do? How should I approach this? It, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that that happened. And I do want to say that as much as I am loving talking with you, this is so cool. And I want to ask you back so we can talk about so much else that we have to talk about. I think that I would love to close this episode out and come and, and ask you to come back sometime very soon and talk more about music and about more of your movie work and more of your artistic work and your DJ work and your sophisticated psychos work. I mean, so much <laughs> of what you do is this amazing art that I'd love to delve more deeply into all of that in a future episode. How do you feel about that? Would you be willing to do that? Yes, I honor you and I respect you and I'm grateful. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you. It's been it's been a lot of fun and going down memory lanes. I've, I've told stories that, you know, I, who knows if I thought I would ever tell them or not. And they just like came up authentically. So it was, it's, re it's really nice. It's been, it's been really nice, especially during these times right now, of vulnerability to just kind of share and just slow down and, you know, share. And hopefully people who hear this are inspired and I know I'm inspired and and I, and I really appreciate you. So definitely oh, let's rock you. and roll. Let me know. Yeah, here. Let's, <laughs> absolutely. Let's do more and get more in depth into some of this. But in the meantime, I have a couple of more things I would love for you to do if you don't mind. First of all, how can people find you? Where are you online? What are the websites and the social media so that people can follow you and get more involved in, in the art that you're making? Well, I just signed up for TikTok. I was going to do it a while ago, but I didn't. And I'm, I'm like so obsessed. And it's so cool because as a creative, you can put effects and you can like mix music with like colors and like editing it by yourself. So it's a real fun thing to do to show your artistic expression um, instead of just like a photo or a video. You can like add layers on it. And that takes, I guess, some, some fun pleasure and patience, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm practicing um, patience. So it, it's fun when I do it to be able to, 
it's a it's a fun thing, but it takes a um so like TikTok is my newest thing. I'm on Instagram and I have a website. So everything is just Chinakis, my last name, C H O N A C A S, C H O N A C A S. It's just everything is Chinakis on all uh, social media platforms. Keep Perfect. it simple, right? With all the stuff <laughs> going on, I have to keep it simple. And lastly, I have uh, a new podcast, which is amazing. I'm so excited. It's called uh, She's All Over the Place. So it's streaming everywhere. If you just type in She's All Over the Place on all streaming services, you can uh, listen to some episodes. Yeah. And what's really cool, you've given, you've dropped so much wisdom. You've given so much great advice. And what's really think, cool about you your, oh, so? yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Really? And yes, for completely. <laughs> and what's really cool about that is that a lot of what your podcast is about is talking about some of this same advice, some of the advice that you give on writing and on modeling and on acting and on, on music. And it's all, there's what you call, I love that you call them 101s. You know, it's the, it's the beginning. It's the, how do you get started? How do you get started as a writer? How do you get started as an artist? How do you get started as a, as a singer or a musician oh, or whatever? So yeah. I love that your podcast gives that information you're just you're free, freely sharing it and i think that's wonderful oh of course of course yeah so so um the basics the roots are the 101s and then each 101 has uh legs and branches of its own so today um everything is scheduled um you know every tuesday an episode comes out but today the episode that came out is um with Marissa Pierce. She's one of the leading hypnotherapists in the whole entire world. And she was Princess Diana's hypnotherapist and counselor and uh, wow. the, the royal family, a lot of celebrities. I mean, she's amazing. I met her um, at a Mind Valley reunion in, um, event that I was invited to in San Diego, California. Mind Valley was created by Vision. And I have a podcast with him coming up soon. But yeah, the one that released today was with Marissa Pierce. And oh, she's just so pleasant to listen to with her beautiful voice and she's so graceful in her accent and she's really she's really helped a lot of kids and leveling up you know their their mental game and the way they think and feel with their emotions so um I've definitely learned a lot from her and um she has this program it's called enough mm -hmm. like you are enough and just like being okay with you and it's like this this hypnotherapy thing that um that I have that um honestly I need, I need to go through and just right now, this should be the challenge. And right now with what's happening in the world should be the time to listen to one a day, because honestly, I haven't listened to all of them and there's, there's a lot to listen to. So I just mm -hmm. really need to hook myself with the discipline and the routine. So maybe with, in conclusion, I'm going to uh, say here that I'm going to um, implement that routine starting today and be on my journey for, um, I am, I am enough with the, the Marissa Pierre. But yeah, check out the podcast and she's all over the place. I hope you like it. Y'all can reach out anytime, anytime at all. Uh, reach out to me on social media and we can connect more and uh, stay positive and healthy. And the most important thing is being kind. It's a practice and I'm practicing more and more um, kindness, kindness and compassion and understanding what that means. That's so wonderful. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for you. It's And I'm grateful for the connection we have. It's... <laughs> It's uh, it's it's it has been transformational for me, and we're going to talk more about that in future episodes because I'm cool. so excited you want to come back. But uh, I also will put all of the social contact, social media contact information on the show notes for the episode. So if if people are like, oh, I didn't catch how to spell that, right. um, it's it's all going to be on the show notes so that so that everyone can find you, which I think is going to be great. And I would love to know before we end, do you have any final? words of wisdom do you have any anything any last thing that you'd like to share yeah make sure you connect with yourself every single day and people are like oh what's myself or i'm with myself what do you mean uh shaman Durek has this new book called uh, spirit hacking um, that I'm into, and I love Shaman Durek. He has a podcast. It's D U R E K, Shaman Durek. And um, I guess one of the chapters or sections in it I heard is um, soul talking, where you're mm -hmm. talking to your soul. And so I've done a couple of his lives. He's been doing some lives with everyone being, you know, isolated in the home. And um, 
they're doing like these soul talks. And so I like two nights ago, I like was in the bathroom and I was just like soul talking out loud. And like, I saw my spirit from when I was like a kid and it was really cool to connect with that. And it felt so good. And that's what I've been yearning for and desiring to really connect with my soul again. So, you know, take the time to connect with your soul, like really just like talk with your soul. And it could just be as simple as that, you know? And, and and it's both simple and extremely complicated, you know, because there are so many different ways to do it. And sometimes it's, it's frightening, but if you do manage to find that one thread that lets you connect with yourself, then you can build on that for the rest of your life. And that's, it, it truly is transformational and life-changing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, Katie Kiriaki Chanakis, I am so grateful that you were on the show. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to have you back. And I, I feel really blessed that I have gotten to know you and I look forward to getting to know you better and better and working with you and creating with you for years to come. Oh, my pleasure, Angel. Thank you, Isolde. Thank Mwah. you so much. Big hugs and kisses. Ta -ta. Thank you so much for all of you who are listening to the show. And if you like this episode, get in touch with Kiriaki. Find at Chinakis on Instagram, on TikTok. Follow her. She's magic. You will love getting to know more about her. In the meantime, if you're enjoying these episodes, feel free to reach out to me or leave a review on the podcast wherever you listen, whether it's iTunes or Google Podcasts or Spotify. I'd love to hear from you. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Mindset Podcast. Until next time, I send you all of my love and remember to wash your hands. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and please tell your friends about the community we're building here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright Isolde Trachtenberg 2019. Today's music was from Kevin McLeod, Laser Groove, and Avi Marimba, brought to you by Creative Commons License 3.0. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, I send you all all of my love.